Major support for these broadcasts is provided by the CUNY TV Foundation, New York Community Bank, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Capital One Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Genova Burns, G. and Tomasi and Webster, M&T Bank, The Wickoff Group, Chelsea Lighting, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional support is provided by Ackman Ziff Real Estate, AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Leumi, USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Colliers International, NYC, Cushman and Wakefield, DDG, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Eastern Union Funding, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Herrick Feinstein LLP, Hersha Hospitality Trust, Investors Bank, New Banks, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, James Orfanides Centurion Holdings, John Katsimatidis Red Apple Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans, Madison Realty Capital, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, People's United Bank, Popular Community Bank, SJP Properties, Sterling and Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, Urban American, and these friends. Ninth child, born on Lorimar Street, the chairman of a law firm that is so long in name, Matone, 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 Magna and Todd, the CEO of the Matone Group, but more important, a legend and a friend. It's great to have Joe Matone here today, senior. Thank you for inviting me, Michael. So you told me that your parents, your grandparents, came over after the Civil War? Yeah, there was. I never knew there were Italians over at this time. Well, the because, uh, you know, the South uh, had uh, uh, sympathized with England, or the Britain, Great Britain, and the uh, tailors in New York were now not available on Seville Row in, in London. So uh, they needed tailors and people like that, and the ones they could turn to who knew something about how to make a, a suit or the Italians. And they, uh, they kind of imported them. Uh, and of course, at that time, there was no uh, uh, Ellis Island because uh, that's- uh, It's before Ellis Island. Long before Ellis Island. You're talking about 1875? Now, you said to me your dad was born in like 1888. 88? 88. In, in, in Little Italy. Little Italy, and he was, his mother, he was, he was an orphan at like six years of age? Yeah, my, uh, unfortunately, my grandparents, Carl and uh, Vincenza, uh, uh, died of some disease, and they left three children, of which my <coughs> father was the oldest sibling. He was uh, six, and then he had his younger brother, Dominic, at, at four, and then he had John at two. And at, at, and at six years of age, where is he living? He was uh, six years that they were living in a little uh, apartment in Little Italy with, uh, with uh, their parents. Right. When it was established that nobody in the family could care for them. Uh, the church made some arrangements to have him sent to St. Vincent's, which was in downtown Brooklyn, run by the, some Irish nun order. And then the uh, two younger ones were, were sent up to Yonkers, which was a Catholic orphanage up there. So what happens at 13 years of age, uh, the, 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 the nun nuns says called them in and said, Jimmy, and don't ask me why Vincent became Jimmy, but it became Jimmy. And they said, Jimmy, you're 13 years old, and now it's time for you to take care of your two brothers. So he was able, uh, through family uh, relationships, uh, a half-cousin who owned the bar and grill, uh, to snare a room in the back in exchange for his uh, polishing the brass. He and his brothers, two brothers, slept on one mattress on the floor and that was their uh, that was their room growing up so then when he's at 20 
he meets your mother. Who's 18 years who's old. Who's 18 yeah. years old. He was born age. in 1890, also a little late, about the American born. And they marry. And uh, they continue living a little early until uh, uh, her uh, grandfather, her father, Rafael Miguel, the uh, uh, grave digger, decides he's going to build in Brooklyn. No, no, he's a grave digger at the, what, Calvary? And uh, Holy Cross. At Holy Cross. Yeah. And he's going to build something in, in Brooklyn. In Brooklyn, in the Greenpoint section in the Green of Brooklyn. Point, and he, he buys this land. He buys right? it 25 by 100. Yeah. And he, he puts the foundation up for this house. Yeah, him and his Laura. brother in laws Alfonso the Great, we call Uncle and they, Alfonso. They, yeah. they put this foundation up. And tell that story because it's a really good story about the. Well, you, you know, know uh, you the, know, they, there were the problems priests. with foundations in the neighborhood. I guess uh, since I wasn't around, but the, the the way the word is handed down was essentially uh, what we would call American, meaning it was either Irish or German. Anybody non Italian is American. So uh, uh, they dug the foundation, and there was no problem. Uh, they take the chair and come over the bridge and. And with all the materials they had, and that was the impetus for him building it, was because he could walk from Little Italy over the uh, the bridge, the, what was it, the Brooklyn Bridge, Brooklyn was complete, bridge. 1905 or something. And uh, he was able to uh, make his way uh, to Alana Street and built the foundation. And But they sit with a gun? Oh, that part. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that was the... As they came out of the ground, their foundation naturally started to rise above the level of what was then the street or the, uh, the non-existent sidewalk at the time because they had to build the sidewalks. And uh, he uh, uh, and his uh, brother-in-law, Alfonso, uh, discover one on returning that somebody had pushed down the foundations from the wet cement. So I guess they didn't like that. And uh, I don't know that the police, to be honest with you, was so sympathetic at that time to uh, So they, they protected these, uh, strangers. And subsequently, the building is built because the building has lots of influence on your life going over. Oh, yeah. Well, it was a, a three-story, which was another problem because all the little houses along Skillman Avenue and on Lama Street were like two-story jobs. So, and so this was three stories, uh, cold water flat, as they used to call them in those days common bathroom in the hallway, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, five rooms, five rooms, five rooms, five rooms. So who lived rooms. in this building? Well, my mother and her, uh, her, uh, 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 my father, and, and all of us in five rooms. And then upstairs lived Alfonso and also my grandfather in a separate apartment. So it was like a, a family conclave, you know, it really was. So later on, you know, your father, um, your father got into the insurance business. You well, see. what happened was, uh, because he, he uh, one thing he always said about the nuns, they taught him how to read and they uh, might have broken his knuckle, but they also taught him good math. They really did. And he was able to apparently get a job with Metropolitan Life Insurance in those days where he sold a policy for $250 that was payable a nickel a week. But the interesting thing is it wasn't life insurance. Well, it, was, it, was, it was grave it was, insurance. Well, it was grave insurance, meaning that the $250 would cover the cost of, of the burial plot. So they were worried about the hereafter, I guess. Now, now you, your parents, you know, had a small family, mom and dad. And your father, your mother was doing tailoring, you said to me? My mother uh, went to sixth grade in Little Italy, which was an accomplishment in those days uh, for a young Italian woman. And she was pretty bright. And she had to go and tell the teacher in the sixth grade and brought her a plant. She often told me the story and to tell her that although she loved to go to school and be there, that her father said, now it was time to go to work. And her talent was in sewing. And uh, uh, she passed that down to uh, even my sisters who worked at Henry Mandel, which is a name that's still around. Sure. She worked in the, uh, uh, the uh, my sister worked in the uh, fitting of the bridal dresses. She was quite talented from my mother. But my mother sewed for a penny a hole as they used to say. So, so now Pop's in the insurance business, yeah. and uh, 
The baby is born. Now, what's, what was the difference between you and your older sibling? Well, about seven years. Seven years. My brother Vincent, who was named after my father and was supposed to be the termination of, I guess, whatever. But your brother Vincent has interesting effect on your life also later on. Oh, yeah. Okay. So you're the baby. You know, as your sister said, they wanted to throw you in the pail. You know, well, you're... I used to say to them, where did I come from? Because my old man often made a remark. He says, you know, you were born in September of uh, 31. He said it was the height of the Depression, so who the hell really needed you? <laughs> but he loved you. Oh, uh, he, I he... was his pet. Now, as I said to you, our, our mutual friend Vinny Rizzo, he was born in the kitchen table in Corona. You were born where? In my sister Helen's bed by Dr. Davis, the Jewish doctor. Three bucks? And I was $3 delivered. And That was the fee? Well, my was father, it, uh, it was my father would never, never have a midwife for things like that because uh, he was Americanized. And he wanted a doctor for my mother, especially in uh, 46 years old. Delivering was, in those days was quite a chore. And now, you were an interesting kid. You, when you were growing up, you, uh, you worked as a soda jerk. Yeah, I, I you worked had, in the uh, pharmacy with Bill Lambert, right? Yeah, yeah, Lambert Pharmacy. I got five dollars a week for forty hours. It was too I much. would cover the umbrella. I would cover every evening, like for two or three hours, while he went home and eat with his family. He was a nice guy, though. And I would be the soda jerk behind the counter. Now, now you told me when you were going to public school, then you went to Stuyvesant. Mm -hmm. And something happened at Stuyvesant. Tell me about this well, the socialist, the, the Joseph Stalin Club. Well, I was Club. fortunate enough. I don't know how, but I got into Stuyvesant. It was one of the premier schools at that time in the city. I, I know it is still today. And uh, this was in the, you, you got to understand, it's in the 40s. 42, 46. 43, 44 was. Right. Yeah, the war was still on, so to speak. And uh, they would pull these strikes. <laughs> I was a 140-pound weekly, and I wasn't going to start crossing any uh, so, picket lines so, or something. So there was Uncle Joe Stalin and uh, Mission to Moscow Davies and all of this, you know, pro-communist uh, So, so Papa Vincent said, hey, enough well, of this. Enough, well, my mother detected it. See, my mother was sharp because she found me coming home early. She said, what are, you, what are you home so early for? I said, Ma, they got another strike on. And I, I'm not going to cross the strike, because huh? I don't want to get my head broken. And then they gave me a, an application for the YCP. So then, they, then they sent you to the good place. They sent you to St. John. Yeah, well, where, where I met the Governor Cuomo in the second, uh, second year. And we've been friends ever since. So wait, you go to St. John's University? Yeah. And now St. John's Prep. St. Saint, Saint John's Prep, and you were saying your dad used to give you the quarters. Oh, the way I paid. paid the $18 my... a month. To wish. Well, because he was a bartender at that stage of his life, and he would give me eighteen dollars and quarters, which I would uh, go to the cashier with and pay the monthly uh, tuition. So now you're in St. John's. Mm -hmm. You, you know, some people go to college for four years. Some people go to law school for three years. You wanted to be in the diplomatic services, but you were, you did a combination of law school of undergraduate at St. John's which we were in the same place at that right. time in downtown Brooklyn, and you went to law school. Yes. How, why did you decide to become a, a lawyer? Well, because mom was too ill to leave. I had to stay home and uh, as the youngest, uh, especially... Uh, at Laura Mar Street. At Laura Street, especially after my father passed in 53. Uh, in 48, he died in 48, and uh, she died in 53. And I had to give her these injections because she would accumulate water around her heart and things of that nature. And uh, so you graduate law school, yes. and now you 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 start practicing law for a couple of firms, right? Well, I went to work for Curlin Campbell and Keating, which was then the premier uh, ownership uh, family of uh, U.S. Lines, which is like the major the steamship company. Steamship company. <clears throat> right. I mean, uh, you got to compare that to what a major family-owned entity there. So, so you're there, and then your brother... Paul, my oldest Paul, brother. Oh, your oldest brother. Encourages it, me to, why don't you open up in the, in the neighborhood? Right, and where do you open up in the neighborhood? Across the street in the fish store. I convert the fish store to a little office, a two-roomer, and uh, what we did was uh, we uh, were able then to attract a lot of local business. And uh, my brother, who was the chief appraiser for the city of New York, 
uh, uh, helped my career a little bit, to say the least. He happened to do all the appraisals for Bob Moses for federal reimbursement. In those days, under the Urban Renewal Plan, you know, they gave you 90 cents back on a dollar. So how did you get so involved with real estate? Because essentially him. I uh, was, uh, you know, like a tail to him. I, uh, he was, my father worked so many days a week that Carl was the, the putative father. He was in the house. He so controlled he wanted, everybody. He wanted you to learn it. And then you even went to, you did some courses at Columbia, you said? Well, I took the uh, Dr. Uh, DeWitt Van Buren, who was the premier appraisal theorist on all the tables. He gave the course and I took that course and uh, got a, a certificate of, uh, of, of, uh, of appraisal from him. So how do you get into your, then, how do you get into buying your first piece of property? Uh, accidentally. Okay, tell uh, me. I'm a local guy and uh, some fellow walks in, Patty, and he says, hey, you know, he says, there's a building for sale over here on Morgan Avenue with a superior box. And uh, he says, would you like to, uh, 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 buy the option, we could buy the option, and then he just, uh, you know, buy it and re rent the building because it was a cheap price, the option. And we uh, turned around and we, I think we put up uh, 25000 each, and we uh, sent a letter off to the owner and, uh, and uh, told him that we were going to exercise the option on uh, pursuant to the lease. And then we had paid a few dollars to Superior because uh, uh, he, uh, he couldn't buy it. And so he figured he'd make some money in there by selling it. Selling you, didn't, you didn't get the building, right? You no, I, what happened is I didn't have to complete the deal because the guy calls me up, Carano, I'll never forget, who, by the way, died with a billion dollars in real estate. So don't feel sorry for Frankie. Uh, uh, in those days, that was money. <laughs> uh, and he turned around and uh, started to call me out and said, what the hell do you want to buy this building for? It's got a roof and the leaks and the wall is cracking and this and, and the foundation is not safe and blah, blah, blah. He was trying to discourage us from executing the, uh, the option. So I uh, said to uh, Patty, uh, the partner, I said, Patty, what do you want to do here? Do you, do you, uh, he said, I'll give you 50,000, you know, for the option back. You know, surrender the option to me, and so he made a couple of dollars. No, but Patty says, "Ask him for double." So he asked him for double. He says, "All right, you got it." So then I knew that we had a good building, a good. And value. you knew it was a good business to be in. Well, making that kind of money in those days was a lot. A lot of so, now. Were you still in Lorimer Street? Still in Lorimer Street. But yeah. th you moved back into the building, right? Th didn't you subsequently? Well, uh, back? that was. The, I was in the fish store, and then we were waiting because of our relationship with Charlie the florist, who had been there for years. You know, uh, to kind of relocate himself, uh, and uh, we had, uh, uh, he took a while, but he went into a very nice area called Graham Avenue. You know, people don't realize that you were very instrumental, and you're you're a fifteen percent owner of MetroTech. Well, I, I how I did that was. Uh, through St. John's, I met some very bright, fine guys who I hung out with. Uh, one was Jerry Kessler. Kessler uh, was one of the smartest real estate lawyers I ever met. He knew all the games, and he had a good outreach. And uh, he turns out to be a partner of Bruce Ratner in the law firm. Now, when I knew him at school, he was driving a cab to keep his family alive and functioning while he went finished his education. And he called me up. He said, you know, Bruce wanted to meet with you because I had told him about your experience, you know, your brother and things of that nature. And then, I guess whatever he told him, Bruce said, you know, I'd like to meet with you. And uh, we did. And we hit it off, you know. I mean... Uh, Brooklyn had its ups and its downs. Yeah. Metro Tech was when, when it was going down. How, how do you get the zoning and the changing and everything? With I want a lot of effort, <coughs> difficulty, perseverance, and uh, knowing the right telephones to be very honest with you. My brother was very helpful to me in those days, you know. Uh, you couldn't buy a piece of city property without him. He was upright and honest, but he would do anything for his kid brother, you know. So if I needed an introduction to somebody in the city for a particular purpose, he would know, you know. What, what about the, uh, your other buddy that you met, who was, you were close with, that you never signed the contract that was a handshake? Oh, that's J Jimmy Malik. <laughs> Jimmy Mannix was the smartest Irishman I ever met. He had charm, good looks, and bright. 
And so could, how do you meet Jimmy? Well, we go to these auction sales from time to time that the city would hold. I was representing Izzy Bazanova, who was a furrier, who would buy... The rabbi. He was a, a rabbi, furrier and a, a rabbi. rabbi. Yeah, Izzy was an unbelievable guy and wonderful man. His holiday was going to the Rockaways, the Silvers, and smoke them a, a, a five-cent cigar. And that was his weekend. And he'd let me go to these sales and buy these properties for him. He says, yo, you see, you nothing to buy, go ahead. And, and then what he would do is tear it down and then keep the foundation and, and build a one-story manufacturing type of building, you know, what we call a, a one-story M1 zone type of thing. And uh, somehow or other, I go down and I buy a piece of property on Hamilton Avenue coming outside the tunnel. And the next thing I know is uh, uh, I get a call from uh, a fellow by the name of Jim Mannix. I mean, I'd like to meet you. Are you the guy who bought the property? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, you know how much you want for it? I says, well, I don't know. I, I'd have to call Izzy and find out because I'm only the lawyer. I'll call you right back, you know. And I did that. And uh, Izzy says, how much did we pay you? How much you pay for it, Joe? I said, 1500 I said, what do you want to ask him, Izzy? He says, I ask him 15000 <laughs> To myself, all right, I'll do it, Izzy, if that's what you want. And I go back, I give him the call, and uh, tell Maddox, he says, I'm coming right down to see you. He comes in, dressed to the tees, and he says, uh, oh, he says, he sees the awards from St. John's and things of that nature, and did you know Father Newman, and I was a classmate of his, and uh, so and so and so and so on. He talks about everything but the deal for two hours. And then finally, I said, Jimmy, I said, uh, would you uh, tell me, please, what you think uh, you're going to make that deal? Because I had that wonderful commission already spent. I was buying a car, a new car, a Ford for $3,600. And what did he say? And he says, no. He said, I only wanted to meet the guy who had the Gullionis. <laughs> asked for 10 times what he paid the other day. I said, no, that wasn't me. That was the client. What do you want me to do? It's not my property. It's not the... And uh, ever since then, then he said to me, he says, you know, I like you. He says, I like to do some business with you. I said, fine. He says, I got this station on Myrtle Avenue and you was there at some place and uh, it's closed and I got, I got an operator for it. What the hell did I know about gas so, station? So you went to the gas station business? I gave him $2,500. He put up $2,500 and... He gave the check to a fellow by the name of Benny, who was going to open the station and run it, because in those days, until you establish your credit, the oil companies would not deliver so unless they paid it. how many did you acquire over the years with? Oh, about, uh, uh, about 26, I think. And then what do you do with these stations? You redevelop them? Separately? Well, basically, we uh, net leased them and then went to Girard Trust of Philadelphia and financed out against the lease pro program. So when did, uh, you know, and still practicing is Matone, 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 you know, because... Yeah get more kids in the business so there are more right, matones. Right, yeah. When did you leave Lorimar Street to go to uh, Flushing? College. Oh, oh uh, well, that was later on. That was uh, when uh, Joe was born. We had uh, moved uh, to um, Little Neck, 51st Avenue on Little Neck. And uh, uh, we attempted then to, uh, uh, my wife made sense. She says, now, you know, back and forth to downtown. schlep. And they had, that was when they had the, all the construction going on, the, mid, uh, the uh, uh, BQE and the LIE. And, oh, God, it would take me uh, an hour and a half to go 16 miles. So over the years, you know, besides Metro, the, you've been uh, heavily involved in Jamaica. Well, in Jamaica, uh, uh, I saw an opportunity that, uh, and in Southeast Queens, uh, we, we put up the first shopping center on uh, Merrick and uh, Springfield. That's Springfield the, well, Gardens. The, uh, the war bombs. That is the, uh, that the was the path, path mark. mark. Path mark. And <clears throat> I think the community really appreciated it. They were fearful at first that I was going to be an adverse problem for the local merchants. As a matter of fact, uh, the city then gave these merchants money, uh, money to freshen up their fronts and you know, things like but that. You uh, know, I, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about you were one of the first guys who did the Mitchell Lama, the second Mitchell Lama in Brooklyn. Yeah, well, the first one was Contello Towers, <laughs> named after the architect. Right, and, and you, uh, you did what? And we did Harway Terrace with the DeMattis organization, the grandfather, who was a cousin of my Aunt Maddie. 
Right, and and even yeah. continuing on today, I mean, you and the Damatis organization we did, did not this, the Azure, the Azure, this magnificent building on First Avenue over there, right, with God. with the, uh, the, the yep. board of education, the in the building. Yeah, the educational construction front, ECF, so and we built wait, a fifty how, million how dollars. How they let you learn to go to Long Island? That you did the beautiful thing right now, where the Home Depot Expo is, and you you recently put in the fairway, which was the best lease of the year in Westbury. Oh, well, uh, that was... You like the, the horses? No, what happened was we always had a fascination with Nassau. And uh, uh, we saw an opportunity that some of the major REITs were starting to dispose of property. And we were able, uh, with Mr. Ficalora's help, by the way, he, he holds the mortgage on it, uh, able to buy it uh, and uh, develop the, the 47 acres, et cetera. And we have now, we still have a Home Depot, we have the Fairway, we have another major tenant that uh, has given us a, a proposal back for the other. A little area. sporting goods maybe, right? Yeah, well, that's, that's I it's think a, area is good for that. It's great, great over there. And uh, we have a theater and we have four, three or four uh, basic nice restaurants and Sprint and a couple of those tenants. So there's the Matone Group, which is the development arm. All right, and then there's the... Uh, and then there's the small five Matones and Megan and Todd, <laughs> okay, you know, over there. But, you know, let's talk a little bit about family. Your first wife passed on. Right, in 89, yeah. And then you got remarried, and you press them. My wife, the Marianne Pesolano. Right. And you have how many kids? I have uh, seven. She had one. Okay, now. No, but we have 27 grandchildren. Let's talk. Name the seven kids and the eight kids. Otherwise, you're really in the trouble. The first one is Julie, who uh, married well. She married a well-known physician from the Sinai uh, Hospital. And then there's Irene, who's a lawyer, who does the co-op condos and closings for the various banks. Next. After her is Carl. Only got a minute and a half. So Carl, all right, Carl does the construction. He's the president of the Matone Group. And then after him came Joseph, who does our litigation. And then after Joseph came Francesca, who is a doctor, a graduate of Sinai and Yale and some other places. And she's now in Chicago at the Northwestern Hospital with her husband. Move on. Come on. I'm... And then finally, we have uh, um, uh, Teresa, who's a lawyer. And then comes Michael, who's the uh, uh, CFO. He's the Wharton guy. So, you know, and I mean, with all these honors, I mean, I can't even announce every one of these. You know, you, on, on, on both Christian and Jewish organizations. Well, so do I told you. I, I know, I, I realize. And Jews, you, you know, yeah. you've always been involved. You were on the board of St. John's. You've been honored over there. You've been a trustee for many years. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, maybe they, if you went to Stuyvesant, it might have been a little different. You know, well, I think they produce some very good people. I know, but you, you know, um, but I, but I, I venture to say, you know, that, uh, you know, Jimmy, your father, Vincent, but changed to yeah. Jimmy, and your mother, let her, uh, both of them, uh, who would, is Vincenzina, Vincenzina, would be very impressed with what the Matone family, your brother, you and the family and all of the Matone. Well, I, I, uh, add a lot, I owe a lot of my success to the people I met along the way. But it's because a combination. My oldest brother, a loving father and family. Education was paramount, you know. Um, the expression was either the book or the gun. Choose the book. Choose the book. And I'd like to thank for having you today on the show. Thank you. Glad to be here.